Hello and welcome to a new Starting conversation series. I'm Bethany Tabor from the New Mexico Humanities Council, and this is the second installment in our Starting conversation series on the topic of history, memory, and public space. In it, we will be building off of our first conversation about historical perspectives, but this time introducing the subject of memory. How does memory influence history? It is undeniable that individual and collective memories bring to bear layered, nuanced understandings of historical events that continue to shape our lives in the present in complex ways. In this conversation with Scott Hartwig and Heather McClenahan, we explore this broad question by thinking through historical monuments, their construction, and reinforcement of history through memory. This series is facilitated by Rafi Andonian. Rafi is a best selling author of three books. He has previously worked guiding visitors at the Gettysburg Battlefield, the Civil War sites around Richmond, the Martin Luther King birth home in Atlanta, and the History Museum in Los Alamos, New Mexico. He has a master's degree in history and another master's degree in historic preservation. Scott Hartwig retired in 2014 as the supervisory park historian at Gettysburg National Military Park after a 34 year career in the National Park Service, nearly all of it spent at Gettysburg. He won the regional Freeman Tilden Award for excellence in interpretation in 1993 and was a key player in the design of all aspects of the new Gettysburg Museum and Visitor Center. He is the author of To Antietam Creek, the Maryland Campaign from, Sep from September 3rd to September 16th, published in September 2012 by Johns Hopkins University Press and is currently working on the second volume tentatively titled, I Dread the Thought of Place, The Battle of Antietam which covers the battle and end of the Maryland campaign. Heather McClanahan is a native New Mexican, born in Las Cruces, graduated from high school in Gallup and spent the bulk of her career in Los Alamos. She has a bachelor's degree in journalism and political science from Drake University and a master's in history from the University of South Florida. After retiring from the executive director position at the Los Alamos Historical Society in 2019, she and her husband were traveling the world looking for warm places to live and got stuck in Panama when the pandemic hit. They have since settled in Las Cruces, where Heather is working on a book about Los Alamos history in between hiking, bird watching, and eating green chili. Without further ado, Rafi, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Bethany, and thank you to the New Mexico Humanities Council, and thank you to Scott and Heather, my panelists today. Um, so last time we, in our first episode of the three-part series, we talked about history, the study of history, what history is, and today we're going to move on to memory. And one distinction I want to make between the two and the way I think about it is that, you know, history is about what happened and history is about analyzing what happened, why it happened, the study of the past and how we, you know, approached mind that mentality to various things around us. Memory is a little bit different in the sense that it's less about the events themselves and memory is more about how we remember the past collectively. By that, we don't mean individual memory. What we mean is things like the founding of the country or the civil war or the dropping of the atomic bomb. None of us were around to remember that. Although some people may remember World War II, there are very few people that are still around to remember the atomic bomb, at least in a way that they were cognizant. And so how we think of the past, not necessarily study the past, but how we imagine the past is what we call memory. And hence the difference between history and memory and the way I see it. And one way to consider that is historic sites versus monuments. Historic sites are places where the events actually took place, such as the Gettysburg Battlefield, or of course, Los Alamos, New Mexico, where the atomic bomb was created or a Trinity site in New Mexico where the bomb was tested. Those are the historic sites, the places where the events actually took place. But monuments, when you compare historic sites to monuments, monuments are commemorative representations of the past that may or may not be on the site itself. You may have monuments in your local community that are looking toward an event that did not take place there in that community. And so monuments are a great example of a representation of memory, of the way we choose to remember the past. And so they have a story to tell. And today in the second episode, we're going to focus more on memory after having focused on history in the first episode. So my first question for our panelists is, how do these symbols of memory, such as monuments, help shape our perceptions of the past? Heather, I'd like to start with you. <laughs> 
Well, it's such a big question to think about, and and there are so many aspects of it. And so I'm just going to focus in on Los Alamos, and and some of the things that we have there. Of course, we have sculptures of Oppenheimer and Groves, and for that, in our community, it's a very proud thing. These are people who are considered sort of the founding fathers of Los Alamos, if you will. And there are other people in the world who would look at that a little differently. There are some people who call them war criminals. And so it really is, you know, our community memory is something that might be different from a national memory or a worldwide memory, just depending on the perspective and, and the time we're in too, which I think we'll be getting into in this discussion. Another big part of what's been happening in Los Alamos, which gets to historic sites, is the establishment of the Manhattan Project National Historical Park. That is sort of turning parts of the laboratory and parts of the community into a national park. What does that mean? What part of our history are, and, and you know, this refers to exactly what you were talking about, Rafi, as a national memory, how do we remember the ending of World War II and the role of the atomic bombs in that. And so it's a really, you know, it's it really is all tied together. We've got our historic record. We know, you know, what Oppenheimer thinks about the bomb, what he thought about it many years later, what he thought about it at the time, what the record, you know, the written record of meetings that he was in stated about, you know, how to use the bomb and those kinds of things. So there's all these pieces that tie together to really move us toward what our collective memory is and then how we look at it. And then it starts to get entwined in politics and so many other things. So um, that's a kind of rambling answer to, uh, to get us started here on how yeah. memory and the history tie together. Yeah, a lot, a lot in there. Now, Scott, what, what would you add to that? What's your experience at Gettysburg? Certainly a place with a lot of monuments as well and a lot of memory. Yeah, it's uh, really powerful. I mean, the monuments are powerful, the landscape is powerful. And um, at Gettysburg, Gettysburg is interesting in that when the preservation effort at Gettysburg began, it began during the war, the Civil War. It was actually just a couple of months after the Battle of Gettysburg, a group of local citizens set out to preserve the site of the great Union victory. Not the whole battlefield, what they wanted to do was uh, some parts of the battlefield. But their objective was the battlefield itself was the monument. That was what they were trying to preserve. And of course, we know that landscapes are going to evolve. You have to manage landscapes, historic landscapes. You can't just let them sit. And uh, over time, uh, the management philosophy changed at Gettysburg. And a new group took over this organization called the Gettysburg Battlefield Memorial Association. And they encouraged monuments. The monuments that were initially put up were monuments to Union Army units that were in the Battle of Gettysburg. And of course, all of these veterans who are coming back want to shape the memory of the people who are going to be coming after they are gone as to what they did, and how they did it. And so to prevent veterans from getting a little bit too exaggerated and extravagant in what they were doing, they actually moderated uh, veterans had to present what was going to be on their monument, the materials of the monument, the inscription on the monument, the location of the monument, all these things were determined. So they could allow a lot of symbolism in these monuments, and there's a tremendous amount of symbolism trying to shape how people remember these soldiers who sacrificed so much on this battlefield. Over time, uh, it became a national military park. So now it's a, in a park of the entire country. And when it becomes a national military park, they're going to open up avenues that uh, connect people to where the Confederate Army was. And then you're going to allow monuments to uh, Confederate states, uh, states that were in the Confederacy at the time of the war, and to units that were here. Mostly what you have on the Confederate side are state monuments. And again, these monuments are trying to shape our memory of what was the war about. So some of the monuments, particularly when you get monuments that are erected in the 1960s, are overtly political. Some of the monuments that go up are not. They're simply trying to say, we were here, we lost a lot of people here, we're not going to get into the politics of it. But um, if you keep up with the Gettysburg and the Civil War, you know that uh, the memory of the Civil War is alive and well and highly contentious still. 
Yeah, absolutely. And what you're touching on there, Scott, I think is that, you know, there are a lot of deliberate decisions that go into creating monuments. They don't just randomly pop up and, and there's kind of a thought process behind those, um, these, these, you know, symbols that are coming up from those who come up with the idea to, to those who are actually shaping it or even the artists, right? So can, can, can you all tell me a little bit more about the decisions that go into these types of things and to um, creating the site or the monuments or the commemoration thereof. Heather, I'll start with you because I know there's some great examples of Los Alamos. Yeah, and I, this goes exactly right back to the establishment of the Manhattan Project National Historical Park. Why do we have national parks? Why do we have national monuments? Is that to celebrate the history in our country? Is that to remember the history of our country? Is it to commemorate? You know, and so you get into these nuances. What does that mean? What is it for? And there was a huge discussion in Los Alamos because there was a very large part of the country who said we can't celebrate atomic bombs. And, you know, if you go to Los Alamos, you will see atomic bombs are not celebrated. They are not worshipped, as you might see in Dr. Strangelove. Uh, they, they really are, you know, horrible things. And that is a message that the History Museum there has tried to get across. But it they did bring about the end of the war as well. And so uh, there was a, a time when the park was getting established that there was a great fear. There was going to be a celebration of the development of the atomic bomb. And, you know, I think for those of us who have lived through the Cold War and, and the fear of atomic annihilation for the last 70 years, you can't celebrate something like that. And, and I actually got into this horrible argument on Facebook with, uh, supporters of Congressman Dennis Kucinich, who had 70,000 followers on Facebook when Facebook was fairly new. <laughs> and, but you know, you also come to a point, which I think we've talked about a little bit too, where, where you're throwing pearls before swine. There are people that you are not going to convince of anything. And so you can say, no, the park is not going to celebrate an atomic bomb, but then people still don't want to hear about it. You know, it's just, it's, it's such an awful thing to them. They can't imagine learning about it. So, uh, so this was a big, a big deal, but you know, the park service, I think more than anybody else in the United States is a trusted government agency. And so we have places like Sand Creek, which was a horrendous Indian massacre. And we don't celebrate that, but we teach people about it. And I think that conversation is what's really been stretched out and has come, has come along over the last decade as we've been trying to get the park established that this is certainly not about celebration. It's about understanding and learning and, and then also context and understanding what was happening in World War II that made the decision to use the bombs happen. So, so there's so much that goes into that, um, but it really comes back to mostly to education. Yeah, one of, one of the things I find really interesting in that case study that you just gave, Heather, is that, you know, earlier I was distinguishing between the historic site and the monuments, which we tend to think of monuments as, you know, um, sculptures and statues. But in that particular example, and in, in really the Gettysburg example that Scott gave when Gettysburg was first starting out, it was the site that was actually the commemoration. It was actually the monument in many ways before there were any sculptures on there. And and so sometimes it gets a little bit, um, a little bit gray, right? Because you have the site where it happened, the monuments are clear, the, the, when we talk about statues, there's are clear commemorations and not necessarily on the site, but sometimes it, they intertwine. And this question came up with the Manhattan Project National Historical Park, for example, is, you know, what does a national park really mean? And, and is, the national, is creating a national park itself creating a monument is kind of the question you're getting into there because the historic site and monument question intersect in that case study. And I think that's what made it so um, you know, challenging with so many different ways of looking at it. And I think that was a really good way that you explained it, Heather. I think when we think of it that way, then I think that helps us see that you know, our memory helps us shape or it helps shape how we see history, right? Because the way we think of the past, the way we might think of the atomic bomb is gonna help us you know, have an understanding or what we think is an understanding of what the history was. And that's what makes that so influential. So my next question to you guys is, how does history shape memory? And in return, how does our memory influence how we see history? Scott, I'll start with you. 
Well, I mean, there's a statement made that uh, history is often written by the winners. And um, Gettysburg is interesting in that when the National Military Park, and even before it was a National Military Park, when it was essentially a private entity was preserving part of the landscape, the Gettysburg Battlefield Memorial Association, it was telling the story of the great Union victory. They had helped preserve the Union, they had helped destroy slavery. Although in that era, they tended to focus more on they had preserved the Union. Uh, this, this is like 1880s, 1890s, and early 1890s. Um, so the, um, so it's, it's this Union victory, the monuments, the monumentation that you see out there is reminding the visitor to this national park, when it becomes a national park, that this was a Union victory. The Union was saved. The Union was preserved by all of this outpouring of blood. And, um, you know, if you were a Southerner who was not Black, you were white, and maybe you had fought in the Civil War or your parents had fought in the Civil War, um, you didn't see history that way. That wasn't your version of history that that you had been told and raised with. So when Gettysburg becomes a national military park, they have a they have a, a conundrum here. I mean, how do we how do we manage this place? How do we interpret this place without getting into a political argument about the, what the war is about? So what they did is um, they marked the position of every unit that fought in the battle. I, oftentimes I always am amused when people say, so-and-so doesn't have a monument at Gettysburg, such and such. I'm like, everybody's got a monument, everybody. Every single unit was honored on the battlefield by the United States government, including the entire Army of Northern Virginia, the Confederate Army. And the commissioners of the park, they were all veterans of the battle. They were, there were three Union veterans and there was a Confederate veteran. And the Confederate veteran was responsible for writing all the tablets that went up on the battlefield. There's hundreds of them that marked the positions of every battery, brigade, division, corps, army of both armies. And the commissioners, these veterans, their task was to write these tablets without praise or censor. So we're not going to praise somebody. We're not going to censor somebody. We're not going to talk about who was right, who was wrong. We simply want to tell people, this is what this unit did. This is where they moved. This, it is not interpretive at all. It's not interpretive, these markers. But they reflect the time period in which they went up because this is still a really contentious period. Uh, the emotions are fraught. So what we're going to do is try and diffuse that and make this very, very neutral. Now go forward into the 1960s during the civil rights era when some of these state monuments to Southern states that have been in the Confederacy go up. South Carolina is one that definitely comes to my mind. They are overtly political and um, try to make a political statement. So they're using the battlefield to try to make a political statement. And then that also leads to controversy today over should that monument be on the battlefield? Um, and it also creates a challenge for the National Park Service because the Park Service, the people visiting the park today didn't live through the Civil War. They didn't experience the Civil War. You have to interpret the Civil War for them. Now, how do you interpret the Civil War? What is, is there a accepted narrative? Well, to some degree, Yes, there is some historical memory about this that is based on scholarship, and you have to try to present the best scholarship that you possibly can, but it is going to have some level of controversy associated with it. Scott, what I find fascinating about what you just outlined there is that while the battle itself has been over since 1863, the event is finished the memory, the way we remember it, and the stories about it, and the lens we look at, we look through when we look at it is always changing. And in the minds of each generation, each of those groups that you talked about, they're having a different understanding of the battle. When the battle, it's not like the battle is being, is, is updating, it's, it's, it's the same battle since 1863, yet each generation is looking at it new. Each of those groups is looking at it anew. And that's a great example of how memory and history are interplaying and it tells me a lot about how memory says more about the people that are looking back 
than it does about the historical event itself. Um, so Heather, what would you say about that? I know there's a lot to be said about how history informs memory and memory informs history. Yeah, and, you know, and I know at the beginning you were talking about sort of the, the greater memory, but I want to give an example of how individual memories can affect history and, and how this gets perpetuated. There was a uh, one of the graduates of the Los Alamos Ranch School, which was, of course, where the Manhattan Project came in. They had to accelerate their school year and they kicked everybody out of the campus and, and the, the Manhattan Project scientists moved in. And one of these graduates, these last graduates, said that Robert Oppenheimer attended the graduation. Well, that was a new piece in, in an oral history interview. Very exciting new piece of historical information. And so we all started tracking it down. And, you know, Martin Sherwin, Oppenheimer's biographer, and Stan Norris, Grove's biographer, and a couple other historians and I are looking, you know, at Grove's daily schedule and Oppenheimer's schedule back in the early 1943. And we concluded he absolutely did not attend the ranch school graduation. But because this is in an oral history from a credible source, that has now made it into some books. It's now made it into some articles. And, and it's like this, this huge myth that Oppenheimer attended the ranch school that we cannot stomp out. We have tried for years and years and years. Robert Oppenheimer did not attend the ranch school. Robert Oppenheimer did not close down the ranch school because he hated the headmaster there. I mean, there's just, you know, all these myths that are out there that are, are really become part of the memory. And then how do you as a historian make them go away, uh, especially now with the internet, because it just perpetuates so many things. And so, so there is this, this sort of, uh, you know, what are the real facts, you know, and, and whose facts and who determines the facts. And so that is, is part of that history. And, and so sometimes you even have an individual memory like that, that will sort of uh, muddy the waters, as it were, and and makes it even more complicated for historians to try and interpret, like Scott was talking about. Absolutely, I think that's. I'm glad you brought that up because it's it's like the you know uh, veterans. You know, if you in, in the Civil War, um, veterans have a certain way of remembering things, and generations later have a different way of remembering things. And um, sometimes a veteran's way of remembering it isn't necessarily quote unquote more accurate. And that's kind of what you're getting at there, Heather, is that you know the participants, the eyewitness accounts are not necessarily more accurate because there are different, you know, time goes by and different elements are into play and they're oh, human sure. too. And, and, and I think that helps then shape sort of our understanding, right? Because um, it just, they're just another way of remembering, another sense of memory. And I'll, I'll, I'll refer to a personal experience. You know, when I worked at Gettysburg, I remember people would come in sometimes and say, you know, I know I saw a monument, you know, here on this particular part of the battlefield, and it was to such and such group or unit or person. And usually that person or group was something that was connected to them, their, their family story, their great grandfather or something like that. And when it wouldn't be there, they would be so certain that it was there, they would sometimes, you know, think that we remove monuments or do we change it or erase it because it was so vivid in their memory. But that's how these things sometimes happen is that, you know, an eyewitness account, you know, if we kind of relate it to our personal experience, isn't necessarily always more accurate because memory starts to shape. The politics around you start to shape. You may have rivalries and all kinds of things. And we see that a lot in memory in various events. So I think it's a great point and a great example to bring up. The eyewitness accounts aren't necessarily the entire picture either because sometimes over time they're shaped as well. So that brings me kind of to my next question, because I think, you know, as I just described, I mean, sometimes politics and rivalries and different things are in play when you're remembering things, even if it is personal, but certainly broadly, generation to generation, Scott mentioned the civil rights movement, for example, influencing memory at Gettysburg. So how would you say, Scott, that, you know, politics influences our historical memory? It has a profound effect upon our historical memory. Um, just to give you one example of um, how politics plays out in um, how people remember the Civil War. In 2008, we opened the new museum at Gettysburg. And previous to opening the new museum and visitor center at Gettysburg, the old museum at Gettysburg, it was possible for you to go to that museum, see the orientation program, which was called the electric map, tour the entire museum, 
go next door to another visitor center we had called the Cyclorama Center, which had a giant 360 degree painting of Pickett's Charge painted in the 1880s. You could see that. Then you could go out and you could do a two hour tour of the battlefield. And when you left, you didn't know why there was a civil war. You didn't know why the Confederacy invaded the North in the summer of 1863. And you didn't know what happened after the Battle of Gettysburg and what was the outcome of the war and why did it all matter? What you knew was how the battle was fought. So we wanted to change that. We felt it was very important for people to understand why had there been a war, why the Confederates came into the North, what happened afterwards, et cetera. And uh, the new museum accomplished that. I think it's a really, really good museum. Even though two thirds of the museum deals with the Battle of Gettysburg, the other third deals with the context of the war, the coming, the aftermath of the war, and then the period of, uh, before the Battle of Gettysburg and after the Battle of Gettysburg in the war. And um, afterwards, uh, I definitely noticed this was just uh, my circumstantial evidence that I could see. It was just my uh, witnessing the number of people coming in. I definitely noticed a increase in the diversity of our visitors who were coming in to visit the park and go through the museum. But the more diverse visitors wouldn't come up to the information desk afterwards and say, you know, we're so glad you're finally telling this story about slavery and the, the, uh, the tragedy of the aftermath of the Civil War, that it didn't fix everything. There were a lot of problems afterwards. The, the, they didn't do that. They didn't come up to the desk and say, you know, this is great. We love this. They would just leave and go out and visit the battlefield. The people who came to the desk were the people who that did not fit their political belief of what the war was about. To them, the war was not about slavery. You made it about slavery. People understood that slavery was seen as a bad thing. So they didn't want, if they had an ancestor who maybe fought in the Confederate Army, or maybe they had some sympathies for Confederate soldiers and they had a, had a particular view of the war, that challenged that view and they were very upset about it. And those were the people who came to the information desk. They were the ones who wanted to write out a complaint. They were the ones who wanted to tell the ranger behind the desk that you guys are, are just cramming politically correct history down our throats, et cetera, et cetera. It didn't matter if you had exhibits in there that allowed them to listen and read the voices of people who actually lived the event and them saying what the war was about, it didn't matter. It, that, that was irrelevant to them. They didn't actually want to hear that. They wanted to believe a certain narrative. And if you challenge that narrative, that created controversy. Absolutely. And, and Heather, I think, you know, can you take that question too about politics over or how politics influences the way we think of the past and memory? Because Certainly Cold War politics is a dynamic that's in play with Los Alamos and, and much more than that as well. So Heather, what do you say? Yeah, and I think, you know, if you're talking about this intertwining of history and memory, if you look at the literature, it's of, of a, a, atomic history, essentially. It's such so telling of that because, you know, you have the 1950s where we're coming out of the war and the, the early histories that are written, of course, uh, General Grove's autobiography and some of these things that come out in the early 60s, they are very, if you'll forgive the term, they're rah-rah. It's like, yay, we did it. We, we won the war and the atomic bomb was the greatest thing. And then you start having the anti-nuclear movements in the 1960s, which I think leads to what we now call the revisionist history of the 1970s. And it was really looking at a lot of the politics that was going on and how, you know, we didn't use the bomb in Germany, but we did use it in Japan. So was that racist, which fits in with the civil rights movement. So, so you know, you have these, these political events that are occurring that really do influence the history. And so then you come into the 1980s where we start into a more conservative political era you have a whole bunch of records that get released, uh, formerly classified records. And so you have new historians that come out with what you might consider a more conservative version of the story that says, yeah, Japan really wasn't gonna surrender. And here's the records that prove it, you know? And, and, uh, and so our secretary of state and our secretary of war weren't necessarily really bad guys that the 1970s historians called them. So you really have these ups and downs, these swings as our politics change our historic memory changes. And it's a really interesting phenomenon to watch. 
And, and Heather, could you speak a little bit about how politics influenced the Manhattan Project National Historical Park process? Because of course, that is in itself a political process to create it through Congress. So how about you carry some of those themes over to there? Yeah, so, and that was a huge political process because, you know, I think what we've all seen over the last decade or so is sort of the, the lack of anything happening in Congress. We really, you know, we have the imperial presidency that we've had since FDR. We have a lot of uh, executive orders coming down to get things done. And it is really, really difficult to get anything through Congress. And of course, this park bill had to go through Congress and we went through the public lands committees in the House and the Senate and held hearings and, and all those kinds of things. Well, where the, the park itself actually ended up was not on a lands bill because the, the committees realized they weren't gonna get a bill passed because they could not, even though public lands bills are always very popular and everybody loves national parks and, and wants to support the parks, Congress just couldn't get its act together. And so what they did was they actually put the park and a couple others on the National Defense Authorization Act. That is the one bill that will get through Congress every year because it funds the military and nobody's not gonna fund the military, Republican or Democrat or independent. So, so they put the, the park on that bill and it actually, there was a little bit of controversy. It was Senator Martin Heinrich and Senator Maria Cantwell uh, from New Mexico and Washington state who stood on the floor and made sure that that amendment got um, tacked onto that bill so that it could get passed. And that's how we got the park was through national defense authorization. Yeah, so, so people can visit the national park today, right? Not yet. <laughs> I mean, there is there's a small, small visitor center in you know, downtown Los Alamos, and you can see bits and pieces. And then once COVID is over a couple of times a year, there are some tours behind the fence that go to the original lab sites. And then there's downtown Los Alamos, which is where people lived and worked. And uh, Oppenheimer's house will be open in the next couple of years to the public. Uh, and there's, you know, great museums, science museum, history museum. So there are those things to see, but uh, the park itself is just starting its interpretive planning. In fact, meetings will be occurring this week for that very purpose. And so it's, uh, it's a long process. The, the bill actually passed in 2014. So here we are in 2021 and we're just getting off the ground with an interpretive plan. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Well, well I mean, as you heard, I mean, there's there's locally the beginnings of, of the park and other museums you can go check out and kind of dig into this question a little more, given these kinds of questions and answers that you've heard to help you understand further. Now to kind of finish off, I want to ask one last question because we've been kind of dancing on the topic and we've been focusing on historic sites and monuments, but we are getting at some other forums of memory as well that we've been touching on. So um, what are some of the other forums of memory of historical memory and how do they shape how we understand the past and ourselves? Scott? The, the biggest is uh, motion pictures for history. I mean, it's, it's huge. It, 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 uh, that is what most of the people who are gonna visit any historical site, uh, particularly if it's a Civil War or a World War II, um, that they're going to have seen a film that has really profoundly shaped what they believe actually happened. And then the second thing is going to be historical fiction. Uh, that's That also is gonna have a really profound effect. And when I started at Gettysburg, um, well, I'd been there for about 10 years, I think. And uh, for every person who came to the park who had actually read a academic historical work on Gettysburg, there were 50 who had read the novel, The Killer Angels. So the Killer Angels, um, you could condemn it all you wanted. Um, you could condemn the history in it, even though the history was not accurate completely, but it wasn't bad. But what it did was it made Gettysburg accessible to a wide audience. So I never, uh, never disliked the book. I felt that the book was a gateway. And the same thing was true with, with motion pictures. Uh, they made a movie about Gettysburg in 1992 or 91, somewhere around then, and uh, which I considered to be like a, uh, a rough Disney film about the Battle of Gettysburg. That was kind of the way I saw it. Uh, but it just reached a huge audience and it vastly increased the, vis the visitation to the park. 
And it was a uh, it was a really good gateway for people because if you were doing an interpretive program, you could ask how many people have seen the movie Gettysburg and in an interpretive program about three quarters of the people would raise their hands and you can say, well, you remember the, the scene about the 20th main and, and what happens in that scene, right? Okay, well, they took some artistic license with that, but here's what really, so you used it as a, a segue to get into what had actually happened. And it was very successful in that respect. Uh, you would run into some frustrating moments where people, whether they had read some historical fiction or they had seen a movie and they believed that was the reality. <clears throat> so if you were telling them the actual historical record, they would dispute that with you based upon their memory, based upon the film that they had seen or the book that they had read. And Scott, can you say a little bit about the psychorama? Um, of course, the psychorama is in Gettysburg and depicts Gettysburg. And say a little bit about that because I find that as a fascinating forum of memory as well. And it was sort of oh, popular yeah. around the world. Yeah, very, very good point. Uh, it's painted in 1887 by a French artist, Paul Philippe Etau. It is uh, bigger than a football field in circumference. It is now 40 feet tall. And the idea of a cyclorama was to, um, it was before motion pictures, you came up a spiral staircase in a circular building. And when you emerged into the viewing platform, you felt as if you were seeing a moment in time of a great historic event, whether it was the Battle of Gettysburg, the Battle of Borodino, the Crucifixion of Christ, uh, a fishing village in the Netherlands, all these different things. It was like you were seeing reality in front of you. So, of course, when you look at the Gettysburg Cyclorama, which depicts the climactic moment of the Battle of Gettysburg on the third day of the battle when the Confederates launched this attack called Pickett's Charge, it depicts that moment in time, very dramatic. And again, the artist has to use some interpretation. He interviewed participants of the battle. He himself had observed the Franco-Prussian War, so he kind of knew how soldiers looked in battle. But still, the cyclorama was an interpretation of what the battle had actually looked like. It wasn't a photograph of the battle, since they didn't have photographs of the battle. And it, um, you know, it's been seen by millions and millions of people, and it has really shaped how millions of people imagine the Battle of Gettysburg looked. And, you know, it's... Um, because he is, he's, he wants to make it realistic, but when you do a painting like that for the, for the uh, mass public, you can't make it too realistic. So while he has a, a part of a field hospital in there and you see casualties on the field, it's not anywhere near as horrific as it would have been if you were looking at the real thing. Yeah, that's a great point to me that speaks to, you know, these different forums you mentioned speak to the power of sort of imagery, you know? Um, even even the photographs and the aftermath of the battle when the battle first happened, some of them were kind of you know the, the, the camera angle or the lens or it was kind of staged a little bit and, and then you're looking at the psychorama and you know what that's depicting and, and then later the motion picture. All of these are images that are really helping shape kind of how we think about the war and and of course the killer angels is not necessarily doing so in the form of pictures, but I find it's a very vivid depiction and so kind of brings images to mind and certainly then became a motion picture because of the power of images. So Heather, what would you say about the, you know, the, the other forums of memory and how they shape our understanding of the past and particularly in the context of Los Alamos? Yeah, well, I loved what Scott was talking about with motion pictures and historical fiction because so many fiction books have been written about Los Alamos. But what became really big for us several years ago was when the station in Chicago, WGN, actually did a program called Manhattan. And we used to tease that we went from the most asked question in the museum is where's the bathroom to um, was Manhattan real? And we had hundreds and hundreds of visitors who were specifically coming to Los Alamos because of this TV show. TV show had great costuming, great acting, horrendous history. But they told us at the beginning that was what they, their intent was. And so it gave us an opportunity as educators to start to tell the real story, which is, you know, I think like Killer Angels, it's, it's a good thing to get people in. And then if we can give them the, the real story, as it were, and there's so many 
outlets for that. As I mentioned earlier, the Los Alamos Historical Society has a phenomenal collection uh, with the Atomic Heritage Foundation of oral history interviews, all available online. And to sit there and listen to these people tell their stories, you know, just so many wonderful uh, experiences that they had participating in the Manhattan Project. And so to be able to point people to those real memories, if you will, um, even though sometimes they are clouded by time, they are clouded by emotion, but there is, is more there than they're going to get out of a television show. But if, if those TV shows, if those movies, if those books bring people in, then I, that's great. And, and I'm happy they do that. And I'm really appreciative of authors and producers who will, who will try and keep with the, the history, whatever the real history is. Uh, but they, they are hugely influential because they can reach so many more people than a museum that sits at the end of the road, you know, in a tiny town in northern New Mexico can do. So uh, it's it's a interesting way that really does shape our collective memory and what we what we see and what we know. So. <laughs> yes, and and I mean, you know, to kind of wrap this up, my concluding thought as I listen to you all is that you know, historical memory says a lot about me or whoever me is, is looking back, or us collectively, um, because there's so many different things that are influencing it, right? Whether it's not just in monuments, but it's these different forums we're talking about. And, and the way we understand the past is itself changing. So it's not, it's not just, you know, the past is frozen, but because of not only scholarship, which is the historical study, but our collective memory through the different pop cultural references and things that we have, the way we see the past is, is always changing itself and says a lot about ourselves. And it makes me a little bit more self-aware that if I think I understand something about the past, that maybe I should look at how that understanding changed over time so I can be more aware about why I think what I do about the past, because that might kind of shape or maybe reshape how I think about it to get a little bit of a different picture, maybe a more accurate picture, or at least understand that there can be different perspectives on the same event. And I think that's very powerful to think about as we are in a time that we are all talking about our histories, however different communities you may define and trying to understand and grapple with that. Um, any concluding thoughts from y'all, Scott, Heather? So I'll start with Scott for a conclusion and, and Heather, any concluding thoughts? I, I think you wrapped it up really well, Rafi, that um, you know, hi history is, is, is always changing. We're always learning more about what happened because there's always scholarship going on. We were doing that all the time at Gettysburg. We're always learning more, but we're also going through different upheavals in our own current history that is affecting how we remember the past. COVID is gonna affect how we remember the past. Um, and, and some of the political events that occurred last year are going to remember how we remember what happened many, many years ago. So, Heather? Yeah, and I absolutely agree with that. And, and, you know, there are new stories that come out, there are new discoveries that are made for historians that will then affect different aspects of what we see in the past. And so whether that's new records that come out, whether that's a, a new uh, scientific discovery, I mean, there's still actually a lot of stuff about how atom bombs work that we don't really know. And so there's all these different bits and pieces of information that come together and sort of move the river forward, if you, the river of history forward. And, and yet it, it flows in different ways and changes depending on sort of external, you know, the rock that comes here or the the uh, landslide that happens. And so there's, there's different things that can affect that, that river as it's moving forward. And it is it very important to be aware of that so that as you were saying, Rafi, we can know what these perspectives are, how they affect um, our own thinking so that we're not judging people wrongly in history. We're not taking them out of context but we are using the history of the past to understand and maybe help us do better in the future. Absolutely. So, you know, different perspectives and different ways to look at something. And we should be aware that the way we see something isn't necessarily the only way. So thank you to both of you. Thank you, New Mexico Humanities Council. Bethany? Yeah, thank you guys so much. That was um, such an insightful discussion and um, so layered. It has my mind racing, certainly. I mean, I think about um, memory and monuments and mythologies 
And uh, I just really appreciate all of your time today uh, and offering the, this, your generous insights and experiences. Uh, thank you, Rafi and Scott and Heather. And uh, there will be resources um, to a lot of the information that was shared here linked in the description of this video. And thanks a lot.